But before we get to Samuel, we must look at Eli and the family, the parents of Samuel. Eli was the next to the last judge. He was a man of God. He was a Levite. He was serving in the tabernacle and uh, the place of worship of God in the city of Shiloh. And he was a man after God's own heart. He was a man that would lead his people. He was a man who judged his people fairly. During his time of leadership, the Philistines came and, and they began to uh, uh, persecute the people. We don't know a whole lot about Eli, but we know that he was a servant of God and that as the per Philistines came to persecute, that his sons were kind of in charge. Eli had become an old man. He had become kind of rotund, uh, to say the least. We learn that at, at his death. But he was a man who was gradually losing his sight. Although he was a man of God and a man of faith, he had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And as a father, or as a priest, Eli was successful. As a judge, he was successful. As a father, he was a failure. His two sons, who should have succeeded him in the priesthood and should have succeeded him as leaders of the children of Israel, his two sons were blasphemers. His two sons stole the offerings that men and women brought to give to God. They stole a portion of it. They blasphemed God. They were immoral men who were not faithful to their own families, but lay with the temple, or lay with the prostitutes around the temple, around the tabernacle. God, at one time, had promised Eli that his descendants would remain and be priests. But when Eli failed to correct his sons of their blasphemy, God told Eli that his family would continue, but no one would reach a ripe old age. When Eli died, he was 98 years old. All the rest of his descendants, when they reached middle, what we would call middle age, they died. Some horrific deaths that we read in the scriptures. You see, you can be a faithful man of God. You can be a faithful woman of God. But one of the responsibilities that you have as such is to train up your children correctly. Eli failed. And so when Eli came to die, as we would say in Africa, there was no one to succeed him. And so God in his perfect plan had another priest in mind that was going to do what he, Eli, should have done. There was a man and his wife, or wives, I should say, who were also Levites. And Elkanah was a priest or was of the priestly line of Levi. 
And El Cana had two wives. He had one by the name of Penanek, and he had one by the name of Hannah. Penanek was very fertile, and she had a lot of children with El Cana. But Hannah was a lady, was a wife, who was not a mother. She was the one who Elkanah loved dearly. But for some reason, God had closed her womb and she was not bearing children. Hannah was a devout woman of faith. She trusted God fully. And each year, Elkanah, Peninnah, and her children, and Elkanah, and Hannah, would leave the town of Ramah, where they were living, and they would go north about 20, 25 miles to the city of Shiloh. And there they would participate in a feast, an annual feast. the family would go to worship together. And as they would go up, Hannah would go before God and ask God for a son. And Peninnah would go up and she would be full of pride. And she would look at Hannah and she would basically say to Hannah, Ha! You're the beloved one, but I'm the one with all the children. And she would put Hannah down. She would ridicule Hannah, and Hannah became one year very, very depressed. She would not eat. And although Elkanah loved her and, 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 and put her on a pedestal, she was depressed. She was born, she was laden with a burden because she had no children. And so she went to the only person that she knew that she could go to for relief from her agony. And so one morning, Hannah went to the tabernacle area and she bowed down before God and she shared with God everything that was in her heart. She cried out to God and Eli was sitting at the gate of the tabernacle, the place of worship, and he saw Hannah. And I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you didn't know what to say or how to say it, or in, in a position where you just had no other person to turn to but to turn to God. But Hannah was down there and she was on her knees and she was praying. She was praying in her heart. She was praying in her mind. She was speaking to God and her lips, lips were moving, but there was no sound coming out because everything was going to God directly from her heart. And Eli sees her and says to her, Woman, why have you come before God drunk? Eli only saw one part of the story. He only saw one side of the story. He saw Hannah. He saw a woman in great anguish, in great distress that was, that was at the temple or at the tabernacle and, and, he would, and she, was, she was mumbling. She was doing something and Eli could not understand what was doing and he assumed that she was drunk. 
Hannah says to him, No, my father, I'm not drunk. I am in anguish of heart. I am crying out to God. I am praying to God. And Eli says, Go, my daughter, and may your prayer be answered. Elkanah, Peninnah, and her children, and Hannah leave the place of Shiloh and they go to Ramah, to their home. And lo and behold, Hannah becomes pregnant. Now during her time of prayer, Hannah had said to God, God, if you will give me a son, I will give him back. You give me a son, you answer my prayer, and I will give my son back to you. Totally dedicated to you. Totally committed to you. One who will serve you fully. When the time comes for the annual festival again, <laughs> Elkanah is ready to go up, but this time, rather than going with him, Hannah says, I'm going to stay here. I'm not going back to the festival again, to the feast again, until I have weaned our son. Our son's name is Samuel. God hears. God heard Hannah's prayer, and she named her son Samuel. When Samuel has been weaned, Hannah goes to the festival with Elkanah, as would normally be the case. And she takes her son, who at this time is somewhere between three and five years old, because uh, in, in those days weaning did not occur shortly after birth. It went on for quite some time with the mother caring for the child. And so Samuel would have gone with his mother to Shiloh at about the age of four. Just say that. The age of four. And Hannah goes to Eli and she takes her young child, her son Samuel, and she says to Eli, this is the one for whom I prayed. I was the woman that you thought was drunk. And now here is the answer to my prayer. And I am giving him to you to raise up before God as a servant of God. Samuel becomes the last judge of the people of Israel. Now the interesting thing in all of this is, is that as Samuel grows and as Eli teaches him about God, as Samuel lives around the tabernacle, the house of God, he doesn't come to know God personally until he is about the age of 12 or 13, according to tradition. One night, Samuel is sleeping soundly, and he hears a voice. Samuel! And Samuel gets up, and he goes to Eli's bed, and he says, Here I am. Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Second time. Samuel! Samuel goes to Eli. Here I am. You called. No, I didn't call. Go back to bed. Samuel! Eli, here I am. What do you want? And about that time, Eli... If the commercial goes, I could have had a V8 kind of thing. 
It dawns on him. Hey, I'm not calling. Samuel's hearing somebody call his name. It must be God. So Eli says, Samuel, go back to bed. And if you hear a call again, you say, speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. And you know, there's an interesting thing here that after Samuel goes back to bed, the scripture says that when God called him the fourth time, God was standing at his bedside. It wasn't just a voice at that point in time. It was God standing by his bedside. And God says, Samuel, Samuel does exactly what he's told. Speak, Lord, for your servant here. Here I am. Speak, Lord, for your servant here. God gives Samuel a message. And Samuel has to tell Eli what the message was. The message was, your two sons are going to die on the same day. And Eli, knowing what God had said to him through another prophet, says the Lord's will be done. The Lord knows what needs to be done. He will do it. And so the Philistines come and attack and Hophni and Phinehas go out with the army of Israel and, and they try to defeat the Philistines and they can't do it and so uh, they try again and this time they take the ark of God and they take it as a magic emblem to defeat the Philistines. You see they Hophni and Phinehas no longer respected God. The people of Israel no longer worshipped God. The people of Israel no longer felt or believed that God was the same God who had delivered their ancestors, their fathers, out of the land of captivity. These were a group of people who looked to themselves and they looked to God as a God of magical powers that would deliver them from the enemy. They had forgotten everything that had gone before with all of the other judges. <coughs> and they took the ark of God out into the battlefield. They were defeated and the ark was taken captive. In Sunday school, we'll look at what happened to the gods of the Philistines. But the point of the matter is, is that the ark of God, the presence of God, has now gone out from the children of Israel. God, in His ark of the covenant, in His mercy seat, was no longer among the children of Israel. They no longer had a memorial, an item which symbolized God's presence, which was God's presence, for He was seated on the mercy seat. And now the children of Israel are left without any kind of physical thing that would point them to the God of their Father. And so they deserted God even more. And when Eli heard that the ark of God had been captured, and that Hophni and Phinehas had been killed, Eli seated on his, in his chair or on his, whatever he was seated on there, when he heard the news, he fell backwards, and because he was so large, it broke his neck, and he died. And Samuel becomes the last judge. 
of Israel. Samuel was a man who believed in God, who knew God. He was a man who traveled on behalf of God around from one part of the children of Israel's land to the land, promised land. He would travel around in a circuit and he would judge the people. He would lead the people. And Samuel was a man who spoke and God did not let his words fall to the ground. When Samuel spoke, the people knew that God was speaking through him. In chapter 3, verse 19, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of his words fall to the ground. He was a man when he spoke, people listened. And they respected him. He was a man of authority. He was a man who could lead the people. Samuel was also a failure as a father. He had two sons. And neither one of his sons were truly followers of God. They too were thieves, stealing from God and from God's people. Samuel leads the people and he judges them for quite some time. But when he grew old, he appointed his sons as judges, Joel and Abijah. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, except for bribes and perverted justice. Two men of God who failed as fathers. They failed to correct their sons as their sons one astray. They failed to challenge their sons when their sons blasphemed God. They failed to discipline their sons when their sons stole from God. And because of their failure as fathers, the people of God rejected them, their sons, as leaders. The people of God today look to a lot of men and women as spiritual leaders. But sometimes those spiritual leaders can fail as parents. And the children they raise no longer serve or care for God. We don't know why. A lot of different reasons can be given, but in this particular case, because of the son's disobedience to God, the people rejected him. And they went to Samuel and they said to Samuel, Give us a king. We want a king to lead us. We want a king who will fight our battles for us. We want a king who will lead us into victory against our enemies. And Samuel was disheartened. And he went to God and he said to God, God, the people are rejecting me as king. Or they're rejecting me as leader. They're rejecting my sons as leaders. They don't want me no more. God said, Samuel, it's not you. Don't put yourself up there. It's not you that are rejecting, it's me. 
They're rejecting me as their king. Now, the children of Israel wanted a king to lead them into battle. Stop and think about that. Ever since the time of the deliverance from Egypt, God had given them victory after victory after victory after victory over their enemies. God had been a perfect king for them. He had given them victory whenever they, their, the people were oppressed and God, and they called out to God. God came down and led them to victory. It wasn't by their own strength. Joshua knew that when the walls of Jericho fell down. Gideon knew that when he only had 300 men against 200,000. <laughs> there was, there was common knowledge. God is our king. But they rejected God and wanted to go for an earthly king so that they could be like everybody else. God had told them what the king was to do and not to do. God tells Samuel, you tell them when you get a king, this is what's going to happen. Now, God tells Samuel when you get a king, this is what's going to happen. God had told Moses when you get, when the people ask for a king, you tell them this is what the king is supposed to do. And what Moses said was not what God said to Matt Samuel. Because God says when they get a king, they're going to take your sons and your daughters. And they're going to make them servants. Or the king is going to make them servants. The king is going to take a tenth of all of your land and a tenth of all of your property. He's going to take your servants and he's going to use them. He is going to raise up an army. God said, in, uh, Moses said, don't multiply horses. Don't look for wealth. And don't have many wives. God says through Samuel, their kings aren't going to do that. They're going to take your sons. They're going to take your daughters. They're going to abuse you. They're going to put themselves above you. Who is your king? Who's my king? Is my king or your king God? Or is it something else? Can we put other things in front of God in our own lives as we struggle with the difficulties of life? When we are ill in health, we go to doctors, and that's good. We take medications, and that's good. We get eye glasses, that's good. We're going to get hearing aids. That's going to be even better. <laughs> I'm going to hear a lot of different things I haven't heard yet. Or before. But the point of the matter is, is we go to all of these people and we tend to rely upon them. When we are in trouble, we go to lawyers. When we have difficulties financially, we go to financial advisors and seek all kinds of help. That's not bad. But who is the king? Who is the one that we can go directly to and look to to solve our problems? He gives us people to solve, help us with our problems, but he is the only one that can solve our problems. Hannah knew that. Hannah, if she had been around today, she could have gone to all kinds of doctors and all kinds of fertility specialists and all kinds of other people that could help her to have a child. All of that is available to us today. But Hannah didn't have that. She only had one person that she could turn to. And that person was God. The King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. The only and it's to Him that we must all turn 
whenever we need help and answers. He will give them to us and He will tell us what we need to do. Here I am, Lord. I yield to You. I give my life to You. Not only in service, Lord, but I give my life to You in dedication and in faith and in trust and in knowing that You are the only God who can meet my needs. Let us pray. Father, we look at Hannah and we see her faithfulness and we look at the people around her and we see their unfaithfulness. We see their desire to, to have things their way. We see a desi their desire to have a physical, earthly king. Someone to direct them. Hannah, Father, saw only you. And she cried out to you. And you gave her a son, a man of God, a man who judged wisely, and a man who failed as a father. But in his failure, Lord, you raised up a king, a king after your own heart, a king whose reign would be eternal. We speak of King David and we speak of King Jesus who is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we, Lord, follow you. Here we are, giving our lives to you. Of course, in your son's precious name, we pray.